He was the most deserving person ever to become president, and he may have been the most personally unsuited for the job. John Adams had a miserable presidency. It began on a gloomy March day in Philadelphia, 1797, at his inauguration. Everybody is very moved to see the great hero, George Washington, leave the stage. And John Adams writes that Washington gave him a look as if to say, well, I'm leaving, now you're coming in. Uh, see if you enjoy the job. Number two, John Adams, Federalist, 1797 to 1801. 61 years old, from Massachusetts. If you think about following George Washington, how does one follow a person who is the American Cincinnatus? Oh my God, can you imagine how poor John Adams must have felt upon succeeding to the presidency to follow this man. He was Harvard educated, yet insecure, enormously ambitious, yet oddly humble. Adams is a wonderful character. I mean, you've got to love him. He's erratic. One day he's up, one day he's down. I think there may have been a little imbalance there in his system. He craved fame and power, but he always pulled himself back and said, no, I must make sacrifices for my country. Some days he thought he was on top of the world, and other days he thought he was just the lowest failure on earth. John Adams is a figure who was in many ways racked with self-doubt, at the same time enormously ambitious. Adams's personality was not suited to the presidency. John Adams certainly had the political pedigree to be president. He was a signer of the Declaration, a member of the Continental Congress, minister to France and England, and America's first vice president. And yet, as a leader of men, John Adams' management style was problematic at best. During his administration, Adams is heavily criticized for his pretentiousness as a man who was kingly in a way that George Washington never was. He was a very, very opinionated man, and he was sure that he was right and did not accept counsel as well as other presidents have. Adams was also prone to fits of anger, which he unleashed on subordinates. This is just not the way an effective executive deals with the people under him. Two issues defined Adams' presidency, the XYZ affair and the Alien and Sedition Acts. Both were caused by a crisis in foreign affairs, the escalating war between England and France. By the time John Adams comes into office, the French are being particularly obnoxious. They are going through a period of seizing our shipping because they don't want us trading with her enemy, Britain. Hoping to quell the crisis, Adams sent a diplomatic team to Paris. That delegation was met with the demand for a bribe. This was reported back to the American Congress. Instead of referring to the Frenchmen who demanded the bribe by their correct names, they were simply referred to as X, Y, and Z. And so this became known as the X, Y, Z affair. American public opinion raged against the French. Hawks screamed for war. Adams is not crazy about the French anyway. And so to be snubbed by the French like this, to be treated in effect like country bumpkins, must have offended Adams tremendously. But instead of acting impulsively, Adams kept his cool and sent a second peace delegation to Paris. For this, the warmongers in Congress vilified him. Adams had the courage to stand against these men. Indeed, he stood against most of the men in his own party, the Federalist Party. But he was firm and adamant in seeking a peaceful solution. Adams would reach his peaceful solution in 1800, when France and the United States signed the Treaty of Mortfontaine. But this wouldn't happen before Adams made the worst decision of his presidency. 
In the midst of our difficulties with France, there were a great many dissident voices within America. Men, newspaper editors, some politicians, who were voicing their distress with the policies of the Adams government. Acutely sensitive to criticism, Adams decided that the verbal attacks were seditious and dangerous to national security. So, in 1798, Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, making it a crime to falsely speak out or write against certain federal office holders, including the president. It stands out as the single greatest blemish on his otherwise extraordinary career. It fed into this image of Adams as the aristocrat, as Adams having this tinge of royalty, of arrogance. And the Alien Sedition Acts simply underscored what his enemies were already saying about this man. Sadly, Adams' support of the Alien and Sedition Acts overshadowed the treaty with France. But the importance of his diplomacy cannot be forgotten. It was a monumental achievement and one of those great turning points. For had we not made peace with France, had Adams succumbed to the pressure to go to war, the history of America would have been very, very different. Significantly, the threat of war with France was the impetus for the one legacy of Adams' presidency. John Adams is the father of the American Navy. It was Adams that understood that if America was to defend her shores, that it was necessary to have a Navy. By creating the Department of the Navy, Adams became the first U.S. president to add a secretary to his cabinet. But even the U.S. Navy could not save John Adams from himself. He had alienated many members of Congress and men of his own party. In November 1800, just after becoming the first president to live in the White House, Adams lost his bid for a second term to Thomas Jefferson. It was a bitter defeat. Adams is not gracious in defeat. The image we have today of the election of a new president, and the former president bids him welcome to the White House, etc., etc. Oh, no, not at all. Adams leaves Washington in the midst of the night. When he left office, he was certainly the most unhappy man in the country because he believed he left office disgraced and unappreciated. During his own life, John Adams' presidency was regarded as the low point of his remarkable political career. It would take nearly 200 years for historians to reassess his contribution to the office. Two presidents signed the Declaration of Independence, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Both died on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the signing.